Hello everyone, welcome back to Microsoft Flight Sim, where I continue my circumnavigation in the Sim Skunk Works F104G. This is flights four through six in this video out of a scheduled 28. And here we are taking off from Greenland, Nasser Swak in Greenland, BGBW, and head towards Iceland, and that'll be BIKF, Keflavik. As usual with the F-104G by Simskunk Works, it's not actually ready to go when you take it out to the runway uh, instead of starting from ramp. So I do start from the runway, but you still have to start the generator, set up the INS. The pylon and tip tank fuel is loaded with the pad that you can bring up and not by the in-game menu. And in this case, I'm only carrying tip tanks, no pylon tanks, because the journey to Keflavik is shorter than most of the flights that we have planned. We normally plan for 900 to 1,000 nautical miles and flights just over an hour long. This one's between 8 and 900 nautical miles and it'll take 48 minutes. So we're going a little bit fast. Oh, and during the startup procedures, if you're trying to fly the plane, do make sure to set the elevator trim for takeoff because actually, if you start on the runway, it's not actually set for takeoff. Uh, so you do have to manage that that might give people problems. And uh, one of the reasons I talk about exactly what I'm doing, for instance, to break the sound barrier is because some things might not be intuitive. And indeed, as noted by one comment on previous video, uh, the F-104 in real life might perform differently than this one. Uh, and I fully expect it does. So I'm going to describe how this one flies. And here I'm trying to break the sound barrier, just keeping it level at 32,000 feet. But that doesn't work. And so I actually dip down. We do go past Mach 1, it's just not convincingly. And you, you can't just be at Mach 1.05, that's just like the maximum drag situation. So what you need is to break the sound barrier with more convincing speed. And so you dip down a little bit. And so here I go to 28,000 in order to fully break the sound barrier, get beyond Mach 1.3, and then we can climb. Uh, it's not good to do it at 32,000, but I was I knew that the F-104 should be able to break the sound barrier convincingly at 32,000 feet, so I was trying, but I couldn't quite get it. Uh, so yeah, here, uh, once we get such a high uh, indicated airspeed, 550 there, it's easy to climb very quickly. But a lot of the reason why it doesn't perform quite right is because of the sim. Uh, initially when it came out, uh, the sim actually limited it to like 46,000 feet and you couldn't actually go above that. There was a while where we couldn't fly any plane above 46,000 feet. And in general, the sim has not been kind to supersonic planes as far as fidelity is concerned. Uh, some do better than others, but it's been rough. So yeah, a flight sim uh, needs some work on the supersonic end. And of course, all of the planes that a Sobo actually releases are slower, much slower. All except for the F-18 that came with the Top Gun update, uh, which initially also had the 46,000 feet limitation. Anyway, there I get rid of the tip tanks, and so now we are clean, and we can go faster. But I still at this point uh, decided to try and go higher up, even though it's not optimal. It's a, one of the weird things about the dynamics of this right now. It's that it consumes the same fuel from 45,000 feet on up to 65,000 feet. Uh, but you actually go slower above 45,000 feet. So it's optimal to actually go at about 45, 46,000 feet. Going higher than that, I haven't noticed it actually going faster. Now, in a previous update, it had. In a previous update, going to 65,000 feet did make you go faster. So it's like the sim is confused about these things sometimes. Here we're past 60,000 feet, but even though it's going full blast level and all that business, uh, it is only holding about Mach 1.7 instead of Mach 2. And uh, previously I had brought it to Mach 2. And actually I would get a warning light saying to slow down because it was hitting its limit, as you would expect. But anyway, uh, it's complicated and there might be other factors involved as well. I did notice that there is an update for the plane uh, that was released in January and so I might install that. I'm still at uh, flight, after flight 16, I'm on flight 17 out of the flights in real time. Uh, this particular flight was in July of last year so I've got a lot of catching up to do as far as making the videos. Uh, but 
Yeah, uh, just to see, I don't want to give the plane a bad impression uh, during these flights. So even though I don't want to have to relearn things with the plane or uh, I just have to adjust too much because things are different, I might take that risk and just do the update uh, in the middle of the circumnavigation and see if it improves certain things. Okay, so here we are landing at Keflavik. Nice views coming in. And... Touchdown. Little bit wobbly. But yeah, during these early flights I was trying various things out, various altitudes and stuff like that to see what would be optimal. I am trying to go as fast as I can uh, during these flights. I generally, in flight sim, like flights about an hour long, personally, and plan for that. Anyway, here we are parking between two airliners, even though there's no particular parking spot. I just decided this would be convenient, and there's the log of the flight for you. 48 minutes or so. And on to the next flight, which is actually to Liverpool. Uh, John Lennon Airport in Liverpool, EGGP. And that is the flight, though I didn't uh, note the distance there. This ends up being a flight of 1 hour and 11 minutes. For some reason, uh, Keflavik on this runway decided to make it grassy for a bit. A little bit grassy. I'm not too sure why, but there we are. And yeah, the same from the cockpit and everything. But no worries, we were able to take off. Takeoff speed's a little bit rough sometimes when we were loaded up with fuel, and this time we are carrying both the tip tanks and the pylon tanks, as you can see. I have previously had a black screen crash because I scraped the tails, so that's one reason why I don't like try to pull up too hard. I know that can happen. And there's also landing gear issues that can happen in certain circumstances during takeoff, so I just try to make sure that I don't cause those, as we add just the right sort of cloud cover over Iceland here to make it really majestic. And I decided to stick close to the coast of Iceland even though our straight line path would actually take us away from it until that became untenable. So as I'm climbing here I enjoyed the coastline and the scenery of Iceland which is very detailed and intricate. Volcanic areas generally are. I'm flying with real world weather, but uh, at this point I think I stopped flying with real time because otherwise it'd all be in the dark. My usual flight time would not allow for it to be daylight in these locations. So yeah, nice detailing on the landscape there. Those clouds look like a volcanic eruption as they are actually. Sort of reminiscent of that. And there's a nice side view of the Starfighter. So after getting some scenic shots of the cloud layers and climbing out to 39,000 feet, I decided to try out the autopilot. And that's because we saw a lot of fuel in the pylon tanks and I just wanted to keep it stable while waiting for that to drain because trying to break the sound barrier with the pylon tanks doesn't work very well right now with this version of the plane. And so there you saw the wobble when the autopilot engaged. It's a very rudimentary autopilot, but it's very effective at holding altitude, which is all I wanted to do. But uh, sometimes the wobble goes out of control. And so then you have to make sure to hit the switch and disengage it quickly and then re-engage it. Basically just turn it off and on is all I can figure. I tried uh, varying the trim or my attitude, seeing whether just having it very, very level helped. It doesn't really, it just sort of randomly decides to not cooperate. But anyway, once I decided to drop the pylon tanks, of course I disengaged the all pilot and descended so that we could accelerate. And we saw last time that trying to accelerate in level flight, at least at 32,000 feet, doesn't work very well. Maybe, I, I, I don't think even at 40,000 feet it would do any better. So. Uh, you do have to descend with this one. But after I climb back up, and in this case to 55,000 feet, I re-engage the autopilot. It gives its wobble, but not too much wobble, and we're all set. So there's the map in the corner there. That's 
more for viewer benefit than anything else because I'm actually looking at a little nav map off to the side on my second monitor in order to do the navigation. So that's how I'm navigating during all these flights. I, I don't want to take any chances. Uh, so I'm effectively using GPS or a little nav map off to the side. I also, during these external views, have the flight information on a stream deck. So not everything, uh, but I do know the speed, the altitude, the fuel consumption, and stuff like that. So lots of numbers available to me while I get the external view. So here without the tip tanks, we arrive at Britain or over Britain. And I'm disturbing everyone, of course, as I will be. I did do a flight with the DC Designs Concorde where I plotted it so that I would never be overland while breaking the sound barrier. Uh, so I did a flight all the way around the world like that. I think I had to cross the Middle East though uh, while breaking the sound barrier, though I could have done that subsonic. It would just be tedious. But yeah, everything else I could do at uh, supersonic speeds only over water. So that was an interesting circumnavigation. Rio Concords did set circumnavigation records. I don't know exactly what paths they took, but I could not beat their time. So they uh, did it faster than I managed to. Anyway, here we are descending into Liverpool. And like I said, I'm using real world weather. And it turned out to be awesomely cloudy. In fact, rainy, I think, at Liverpool. And this is a dramatic descent into a mass of clouds, so I present it in full. <laughs> what is below? How far up are we? Good question. So you note the air brakes out. And here I cut the engines. And as we poke through the clouds, if we can get through the clouds, this is where having the altitude display is really helpful. Nice rainbow. And yeah, not much distance between the bottom of the cloud layer and the ground here. Inside the cockpit, you can see the caution because I'm running out of fuel, as I should be for all these flights. That's the plan, to be close to running out of fuel by the time I land. And here we're barely above the ground. Not what you're supposed to do while landing, but I was trying to get a visual on the runway. And ultimately, I'm just showing the conditions. So let's glimmer, see a glimmer of it there. Now, uh, somebody noted that I seem to be seated very low in the cockpit. You can press spacebar to lift yourself up. However, whenever I've done that and tried to land, uh, it's sort of a little bit distorting your sense of how you're coming in. And so I always land hard when I sort of sit myself up. It's a little bit better for me to figure things out and make the landing smoother if I just keep it down here, but sometimes I'll lift myself up if it's unavoidable. So there we are on the ground. Not too hard, hopefully. I don't know what standard is for the F-104. It is a strange plane, so. Here I do find a slot and park myself in there. I guess I'm among the easy jets and shut it down. So that is the logbook entry for this one, one hour and 11 minutes to Liverpool. And next up, I fly to Rome, Lumicino, L-I-R-F. So that's quite a flight. And none of these flights are sightseeing flights per se, except, you know, in the geological sense, really high up, uh, because the F-104 is not that kind of sightseeing plane. So yeah, even though we'll be flying over London and Paris and all that, it's going to be from a fair height. There's the view out from Liverpool. I do have to turn around, so we'll get 
plenty of other views of the surroundings. The F-104 has sort of a ponderous feel to it when it's got all four fuel tanks, and they do add drag to it. That's one of the things about the Sim Skunk Works uh, plane is that it actually simulates the drag on the fuel tanks, and quite a lot of drag, in fact. The effect of that could vary from one Sim update to another, potentially, I'm not sure. But in any case, it's a little bit dangerous to just go sightseeing at low altitude or turn very quickly at low altitude with the plane when it's carrying its fuel tanks. Anyway, here we are approaching London, and as it turns out, I do have to dump the pylon tanks and break the sound barrier here, so we, uh, yeah. Well, I, I don't actually drop the pylon tanks on London itself. I, I swear I tried to mitigate any possible damage, uh, but, but we're pretty darn close to London when I lose them. And uh, here we see the River Thames, and we're crossing London just as I'm going decisively past the sound barrier and then climbing up again to a better altitude. And a backwards view of London from really high up, and a little bit of a shimmy there for some reason. It does develop those every now and again. And we continue to climb as we are decisively supersonic and head on to 40,000 feet as we approach the channel. And so departing Britain here, head towards France. There's a backwards view of Britain. And there's France. We're not exactly headed directly to Paris, uh, so we won't get the best view, but again, we're not going to get the best view anyway. So here I level off at about 56,000 feet, 56,200 according to altimeter. And we do have the autopilot on, otherwise it wouldn't be that stable. Uh, without the autopilot, it does tend to go up and down a bit. There's no way to trim it perfectly. Not by hand, anyway. I ended up being an equal opportunity offender here as I need to drop the tip tanks. And it turns out that I'm dropping the tip tanks and the outskirts of Paris, so it was the pylon tanks on the outskirts of London, tip tanks on the outskirts of Paris, a fair is fair, I suppose. And so there we have lost them. I don't know if this counts as the outskirts of Paris or whether I'm actually too far out, but I mean, Ile de France is right there, so it's close enough. So, onward with uh, no encumbrances now as we continue to roam. Well, we're not actually going to fly over Rome or go... Uh, Flumicino is pretty far off from the actual city of Rome. But yeah, uh, in principle, we're landing at Rome. And so a brief alpine jaunt behind us there. We uh, cut a corner of Switzerland. I've definitely flown over this particular part of Italy much slower and lower in at least one of my around the world mini planes flights. And throughout all this, the Alpine has been perfectly stable, holding 56,200 feet, as you can see. And Genoa. So there's the city of Genoa below us. I didn't stay particularly close to the coast of Italy down to Rome kept my distance. One place that didn't get to enjoy my sonic booms, I suppose. That depends on how far they probably do. But ultimately, I finally had to descend and slow down. And so we are off autopilot and I cut the afterburner, which is a very dramatic thing to do. It shudders a little bit. And boy, do you lose altitude quickly when you do that. Uh, if you're thinking of judging the distance to landing like an airliner, this is not an airliner. It doesn't have that kind of uh, lift <laughs> at all. Uh, it drops fairly quickly when it loses speed. But not quickly enough as it turns out for me. I had to uh, pull out the air brakes and descend a little bit faster in order to make Flumicino. Thankfully, it was a nice clear day here for a landing, but we're still way out from Rome, so we don't get to see any of that. But uh, this landscape is nice too. 
just got a little bit of a shimmy there as we slow down. And the uh, customary caution light indicating that I'm running out of fuel. Coming in at 200 knots, guaranteed to have the flaps down at this point at that speed. But remember, with this plane you have to keep the throttle at 56% RPM, otherwise the wings won't get air to generate lift. Uh, well, the flaps in particular. So the bleed air from the engine is used, blown over the wings. And you have to keep the engines going. Now that, I don't know why I tilted right at the end there. That was strange. That was pretty nice and level coming in and I didn't have any particular reason to tilt, so I don't know what happened there. But anyway, uh, that could have gone horribly wrong. The landing gear isn't exactly a wide base, but managed to hold it. And here we are getting to a parking spot and that'll do it for this video. So arriving here at Fluencino LIRF and we will see where I fly off to next time. It will not be a European tour, I'll tell you that much, uh, because we're going at high, high altitude, so we might as well take a variety of landscapes in. So with that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.